Today we present examining the history of Voynich glyphs using phylogenetic methods by Katie Painter and Claire Bowen. To begin with our background and aims, parchment dating and feature evidence points the manuscript to be dated to approximately the 15th century. The aim of this paper is to shed light on Voynich glyphs and their potential provenance by examining their place in larger script traditions. Our analysis relies on phylogenetic methods, which will be presented in the slides to come. We begin from two main research questions. First, can the features used in paleography be used to differentiate between script families across time using phylogenetic methods? For example, can we distinguish between a Beneventum and Carolingian hand by using phylogenetic methods? And if so, which features will be most useful for doing this? Our second question is, what are the most likely origins of Latin-like letters in the Voyage script? Do they seem to come from a particular tradition or perhaps multiple traditions? In sum, we are seeking to better understand the Voynich manuscript by asking where it might come from and what scribal traditions it might contain. To give a brief overview of the phylogenetic methods employed, these are a flexible means of identifying clusters among items with shared histories. They allow for us to investigate both the strength of the clusters, meaning how well defined they are, and also which features in the dataset contribute most to the groupings. Historically, phylogenetic methods have been employed to study musical trends, language divergence, and other aspects of culturally transmitted information, for example, folk tales. In this paper, they are used to investigate the different hands that might be influencing the Voynich script. The caveat to this process is that we are not attempting to decipher the manuscript, nor are we making any claim about mappings between glyphs and sounds. Our interest lies instead in the shapes of the glyphs. And for this reason, we are hoping to find the differentiating features that can tell us more about where the script might come from and attempt to locate the Voynich script within known scribal traditions. Now to present our methods. We pulled from 52 manuscripts currently held in the Beinecke and Cushing libraries at Yale University, all of which were written between 700 and 1500. 30 of these manuscripts were written in Latin or copied, the rest in German, French, English, and Italian. To take samples, we selected images of individual characters taken from each manuscript, and then performed analysis and coding methods which will be outlined in the slides to come. We performed the exact same process for the five Voynich hands as per Davis 2020 and coded these separately. This was a sample of convenience. However, we contend that tentative conclusions can be drawn from the data set at hand. The scripts that we looked at fall into four main groups outlined below. These are uncial, minuscule, Gothic, and humanistic, some of which contain multiple subgroups. Again, there's about an 800 year range between all of these four groups. And our task was to see whether we can situate the five Voynich hands per Davis 2020 within this 800 year period. The glyphs that we looked at were the 10 among the Voynich hand that most resemble Latin letters and Arabic numerals. These are listed below, the first six of which are the Latin letters, the last four being the Arabic numerals. We considered including other scripts. For example, the Greek nu resembles one of the Voynich glyphs. However, because the greatest number of comparators exist in Latin scripts, we restricted our study to only Latin scripts and have compiled this list here. For this reason, we were not able to examine the most distinctively Voynich glyphs, such as the gallows and bench figures, which are seen here. In coding our manuscripts, we selected a one to represent present for the features, zero to represent absent, and then some features were also more variable. Some of our features were common to all, for example, the ligatures were universally examined across all of the different characters that we selected. Some were more letter specific. For example, the final squash was only a feature that was relevant to the M characters and the uptick serif was only something that appeared in the eyes. In total, we identified 110 different features that we chose to examine. And these were selected based on paleographical studies and manuscript definitions of the different uh, scripts that we were comparing across the hands. In general, we were looking for ligatures, serifs, and then different features to characterize the shape and size of each character that we were hoping to investigate. An example is shown here with the A glyph, uh, including the list of features that we selected to examine for each A that we looked at, and then also the definition of that feature that was used to evaluate the image that we took from the libraries. We have shown here an example of one of the coding sheets um, that was used to evaluate the two different samples of Gothic scripts for the glyph A. Here we have the English and the German examples. And our sheets include the manuscript title, the hand, the year, and then the glyph that was sampled from the manuscript holdings. On the right side, we then have the codings with ones and zeros that were used to evaluate the different features that we looked at. We can see here a number of important insights from the data at hand. Um, 
For one thing, we see that the double story is a particularly useful feature in distinguishing between English and German scripts. We see that it's almost universally present in the English scripts that we looked at and only one in the German. So it becomes particularly helpful in distinguishing which kind of script we're looking at. We also see that some features are remarkably stable across all of them. The hook shape, for example, did not appear in any of the Gothic scripts that we looked at and turned out to be a particularly helpful feature for distinguishing Benevento manuscripts. Um, some more variation persists in some of the other features that we looked at, uh, for example, the vertical stroke, which looks at the axis of the A and to what extent it's slanted uh, even to the left or the right. This was a more variable feature that has kind of the same amount of variation in both of the scripts here. Uh, some of the variation can be attributed potentially to individual scribal variation more than the variation within the script itself. So this is a challenge when looking at such data. Um, in general, the Unschul counter was also something that seemed to vary potentially by age. So some of the older manuscripts had these and then it seemed to drop out as we moved ahead in time. Overall, organizing this sort of data allowed us to determine certain patterns within the, the scripts we were looking at, noticing that certain features were correlative for example, if a serif included in an M, it tend to occur as well in the N. Um, and in general, it allowed us to then perform the phylogenetic methods of analysis, which we will now turn to in the preceding slides. Well, thanks, Katie. So I'm going to talk about the clustering and network methods and then take us through the results that uh, that we found. So we have our, at this point, we have our coding table that has the features of the characters and the manuscripts coded as ones and zeros, presence or absence or variable, although we're not going to talk about that here. From that, we need to convert this matrix into something that we can use for clustering. And so for that, what we do first is compile a distance matrix. This tells us how similar or how different each manuscript is from every other manuscript in our sample here. So we do this both overall with all the features we talked about, but we can also do it for subsets of features. We can do it, for instance, for all the ligature features or all the size features, or we can do it for individual characters uh, or individual um, uh, letters and, uh, and numbers. Uh, for example, the number of features that we have for each uh, letter or number varies between five and 13, if I remember right. And so different letters contribute different amounts of information to the overall uh, character so by or the overall distance matrix so by looking at different uh, slicing up the data in uh, data in different ways we can see how different features and different sets of features contribute to these manuscripts looking more or less similar to and to each other on the digital coding side so in order to do that we take the ones and zeros each individual character that's been coded and we just look pairwise between each set of manuscripts and or each pair of individual manuscripts and see how many features they have in common, uh, how many features differ, and we use that to construct a distance matrix. So to give an example here, Osborne A1 and Beinecke 556, uh, we're looking at six of the more than 100 features. Four of these features are identical. So they both have ones in this feature, ones in this feature, um, zeros in the second last feature, and ones in the, the last feature. But for the second and third features, they differ. Osborne A1 has a one, Beinecke 556 has a zero. So we can say that there are two differences out of six in this case. Um, so they're, they differ in a third of the features. So their distance difference is 0.33. Um, or they're 0.66 similar if we talk about similarity matrices. Here we're, we're using distance difference matrices, so we're talking about the distance between the two. This was just one pair of manuscripts. We would then do that for uh, pairwise throughout the, the manuscript. So Osborne A1 would be compared not only to Beinecke 556, manuscript 556, but also to uh, manuscript 516, 528, 496, and to the Voynich manuscripts and to the Voynich hands. And so from that, we get a distance matrix, the uh, a part of which you can see uh, here below on this slide, which gives us a sense of which manuscripts are most similar to which other manuscripts. And um, we can then use that to build our tree. In order to build a tree for, there are many different tree building methods in phylogenetics, some of which rely on the features directly, others of which rely on the distances between different manuscripts. Here we're using a distance-based method, so we're looking at the distance, we're compiling it from our distance matrix. 
there are also many different types of clustering methods. Some of these clustering methods are what's called agglomerative hierarchical clustering methods. So they agglomerate, they take pairs of items and compare them, group them together, and then refer to that group as a whole and continue um, hierarchically, that's why they're called hierarchical agglomerative uh, methods, to, uh, to produce a tree that exhaustively classifies all of the items under comparison. There are other types of methods called um, uh, other types of methods where the agglomeration does not immediately take place. These produce networks, so they allow us to see some of the potential conflict in the data, where there might be ambiguity in how different manuscripts are grouped together. And those are the methods we're going to use here. We find that that's a more useful method of seeing not only the particular groupings, but also the strength of those groupings or where there might be some, uh, some conflict or differences in that. So let me now show you an example of this and move on to our results. So this is a neighbor net. Uh, this is a type of network that is produced from uh, non-agglomerative uh, it's still hierarchical, but non-agglomerative clustering. Th these are all the features for all the manuscripts. So not only the letters, also the numbers for both the Voynich characters and the Voynich manuscripts and the other manuscripts in the sample. And a num I want to point out a number of things with, uh, with this to start with. So first of all, all the Voynich hands cluster together. Um, that's that's good, right? That's that's a result we are, um, uh, are happy to see because that is not necessarily the case given the differences in hands that um, that uh, Lisa Fagan Davis was uh, was able to identify in um, in her twenty twenty paper. Uh, we also see that some of the groups of hands cluster together reasonably closely, but others do not. So, for instance, the Unshul manuscripts form a cluster here where they're all on the same branch of the tree, and there's minimal conflict in that uh, in that branch. We also see um, here are um, some of the Beneventan manuscripts. They also form a um, a cluster within the uh, the tree itself, although there are more individual differences um, here than there are, for example, for the Voynich manuscript um, hand codes over here. In other cases, we don't see the same sort of clear cluster clustering. So here, for example, we have um, a number of English Gothic manuscripts, English and Italian Gothic, and um, there's a small cluster of Carolingian manuscripts, but they're all, uh, if you compare this part of the tree to the part of the tree that has the Antrel and, uh, and the Voynich characteristics, you can see that this is much more network-like. There's much less resolution in the, uh, in the tree. And so this is a result that's coming out of the clustering and the classification and the, the coding of the, the scripts. Some of these groups of hands are more tightly networked together than, uh, than some of the others. Uh, but for the most part, we're able to reconstruct the and recover the main script groupings that, um, that have been found through paleographic analysis. Now, these are all the uh, features overall, so they combine all of the features and all of the manuscripts. We were interested in seeing what particular types of features might be particularly driving these results and might be co particularly contributing to the uh, to the results as well. And so to do that, I'm not going to show you networks. I'm going to show you features uh, of presence or absence of uh, of features in uh, in these graphs. So to read this on the x-axis here are the percentage of feature percentage of times a feature of a particular type is present in a particular manuscript the y-axis are all the manuscripts you can't read the labels you're not expected to read the labels the groups of hands are color coded so for in, and they're all in the same order throughout the manuscript so for instance the um Voynich manuscripts are always at the top followed by Unshul, followed by semi-Gothic, um, the other not elsewhere classified manuscripts here, um, Gothic, Carolingian, and Beneventan are, are here. And so in this case, what we see is the percentage of time a ligature character is coded as present. And then we multiplied that by 10 to produce a scale between uh, between zero and 10. So in this case, you can see that for the most part, the ligature features are present about half the time. So that is about half the characters coded had a 
ligature present and the other half of the time there wasn't. The um, exceptions to that are the Voynich characters and the Unshul uh, manuscripts where the ligatures were less frequent. So they are here um, least present in the Unshul manuscripts and here between uh, roughly 30% of the ligature features were present for the Voynich manuscript. So the Voynich hands cluster together on this and they are different from pretty much all the other manuscript traditions we coded except for the Unshul manuscripts. And so this is what's driving, we think, most of the grouping of similarity between Voynich and Unshul scripts that we see in the neighbor network. So you can see that Voynich and Unshul here are on, on their own branch, uh, along with a Gothic manuscript and um, a hand that's not otherwise classified from the uh, from the 14th century. Um, but most of the most of the results are driven particularly by the ligature features. If we look at some other features, we can see that the manuscripts are more variable, more uh, both more different from the Voynich manuscript, but they're also internally variable. So these are probably not particularly good features to try and classify paleographic traditions, manuscript hand traditions. So if we look at the serifs uh, here, we can see that uh, for not only the um, Beneventon or the Carolingian manuscripts or for the uh, for the Gothic and um, and semi-Gothic manuscripts, the proportion of presence of serif characters ranges from 2.5 to uh, to 10, with the exception of the Voynich manuscripts uh, hands which cluster towards the low end. So they tend not to have serifs, at least in the characters we uh, we examined um, here. So you can see that that's also driving Voynich distinctiveness, but it's also not particularly helpful for either characterizing individual hand traditions or for grouping Voynich with any particular um, characteristic within that, uh, within those, uh, within those other traditions. If we look now at the shape and size traditions, um, it's to some extent a similar story. So for the shape traditions, Voynich hands cluster. The um, Unshul hands cluster. Other ca script characters show a show more of a, a variation. Although the um, perhaps the closest that Voynich shows is uh, in terms of both um, compactness and absolute number of these features is in the uh, the Beneventon hands here too. Um, and for size characteristics, Voynich is again stands out as somewhat distinct um, and the other characters at the other hand show a, a range although we can see in this case that the range is more compressed and is more uniform and these features are actually mostly absent from the uh, from the data set as a whole so it's clustering towards the zero end rather than say more in the uh, in the middle. So from this we can conclude a number of things about the relationship between Voynich glyphs, Voynich letters, and other script traditions, and the use of phylogenetic methods for for this purpose. Uh, neighbor networks, the method, the clustering method we used here, do pick out different tribal scribal traditions, at least to some extent, using these characters. Not in every case, but in some cases, it picks out Voynich as distinct, Unshul as distinct, and a number of other sub uh, sub categories as uh, as well. From this. We see that Voynich is closest to the Unshul scripts, uh, Unshul manuscripts, but we also see that this grouping is driven primarily by a lack of ligatures. It's not overall features of the script, it's one particular type of feature that we coded for. In terms of the shape characters, Voynich glyphs are closest to the Beneventon hands, but there's not a strong degree of resolution in, uh, in, this, uh, in this data set. And we wonder if perhaps the most identifiable glyphs for script traditions other than the Voynich manuscript tradition simply don't occur in the Voynich orthography. So we were unable to compare G's or H's or Q's or R's or um, Z's, for example. And so if we'd been able to include a wider variety of characters, oh, sorry, a wider variety of letters, we may have been able to code for um, features that might give us a greater set of distinctions. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Uh, we can take questions during the conference and we look forward to your feedback.